you guys may or may not know that I was the founding storage project chair for the Open Compute Foundation long before I actually came on board and started working with the foundation. Um, I, uh, I was asked to sort of lead storage and create the charter and the mission statement, and it was, um, it was really interesting to get a number of you know, thought leaders and experts from Goldman and, and uh, companies like Seagate and Western Digital and uh, a number of our partners. And we spent a long time trying to figure out you know, what should our mission be, what should our, uh, our charter be, because storage is just one of these areas that just, there's, there's so much innovation happening right now, there's so much that we could be doing with storage um, that uh, we didn't want to confine ourselves, as, as Chris just said, we don't want to put ourselves in a box. So we kind of ended up at a charter that ended up being kind of broad and sort of allowed for this unplanned garden. And, um, you know, a testament to that unplanned garden and sort of a legacy that I think lives on in that project um, is um, as an example that our next speaker is going to come up and talk to you about right now. I happen to be walking around the OpenStack event in, um, in Hong Kong and, um, a, 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 in fact, um, a transitioning storage project chair, John Dickinson from a company called SwiftStack, who is also a big open compute uh, supporter and member, was a project lead. And so I've got a great relationship with uh, SwiftStack folks from, um, from the OpenStack days, as well as John being a project lead. And I remember going to their booth in Hong Kong and seeing this really cool technology. And I was like, man, how could we get that technology into the foundation? And like, oh, well, this is the, these are the guys responsible for it. So I ended up like hallway conversation walking over to this woman who was, uh, was responsible for this technology. I said, hey, we should meet for breakfast and like, let's talk about this technology. I thought it was, I thought it was just game changing. And it was based on that random sort of coincidence of, uh, of just getting, get, you know, getting to see some technology in a booth. Uh, so for those of you that, you know, have not been over to our exhibit hall yet and seen that, definitely check it out because there's some really cool tech there. And that's ex actually how I found this tech. Um, that's how I've got. To, that's how we became aware of of Kinetic, which uh, um, Ali Fenn from Seagate, who is Seagate's uh, senior director of advanced storage, um, she's going to come out and present uh, Kinetic, which you saw on Frank's slide earlier this morning. And this is a technology in the storage ecosystem that I'm just really excited to see. Um, there are um, there are game changing reference architectures to be deployed from this. So please help me in welcoming Ali Fenn. Everybody. Really glad to be here, and thanks for that introduction, Cole. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Kinetic today, and uh, it is things are happening fast. As Cole said, he first saw about it in November. We introduced it in October. We've got a lot of traction going on. There are a couple thing, couple systems here on hand in the expo hall, so I hope everybody checks those out from both uh, Hive and WeWin. But let me dive in. Um, Kinetic is all about scale-out object storage, and Here's why. A couple numbers from our uh, Seagate market research and from other industry sources. If you look back to 2010, the, number, the, the amount of data that was stored in the cloud was about 25% of the total, and it was about 100 exabytes. If you look forward to 2020, that number becomes 7.3 zettabytes of cloud storage only. That's 56% of the total that's projected to be stored, 13 or so. Um, and 90% of that data is unstructured object type data, right? What that gets you is about six and a half zettabytes of unstructured data going to be stored in the cloud. Um, that is a gigantic number, right? And it's object data. So that's why we're focused on this space, because we think that that has some very unique uh, both um, opportunities and imperatives for us to all deliver on. So just to put a slightly finer point on it. How big is six and a half zettabytes? Well, one example is if you took a bunch of these four terabyte drives and stacked them up side by side in one inch increments, it would go around the Earth. It's about 26,000 miles, I think. Um, another way to look at it is if that were all HD video and you played it back, it would take about 85 million years. Um, it's a tremendous amount of data. But perhaps more importantly, uh, we need to look at the cost to store that much data, right? I'm from Seagate. I want to sell all those drives. That's a great, that's a great opportunity for us. 
Um, and as Fritz just said, hard drives are great. They're not going away, right? We all need them. Um, but $240 billion is what it would take if you looked at today's economics and racks full of JBODs and low-cost servers. Now, of course, you have Kreider's Law, and there's going to be some, <laughs> there's going to be some downward trend in dollars per gig and everything. But any way you slice it, we're still at least five zettabytes of a gap. And we need to somehow think about ways to really disrupt those economics so that we can all collectively as an industry get there. So the good news is there's a ton of stuff happening, right? Um, you heard, I think you heard Mark Zuckerberg this morning say that they had saved $1.2 billion based on open compute. And that's great. It's a huge start. But remember, we just talked about $240 billion more that needs to be stored. So you have open compute. It's great. You have tons of contributions. You have tons of member companies. You, you've just heard about great, great case studies of real usage at scale. You have OpenStack, Cole Reference SwiftStack. Um, the Basho guys are doing React. Obviously, there's Ceph. There's HDFS. There are a tremendous number of open source communities and projects that are, that are well underway to help us all try to have a much faster pace of innovation, much more flexible, and much lower cost. And all of that's great. Uh, but I don't think it's far enough, right? So the real question is, what can we do uh, from the device perspective up to really help enable the next leap forward in, in, in economics? And I think in order to look forward like that, the best thing is to actually look back. So, some great technologies, um, but developed a long time ago that underpin most of today's storage architecture. So RAID, POSIX, po the traditional file systems, these things have been you know, launched, conceived of, and been running for decades now. Um, and you see them in this caricature of a, a somewhat traditional storage stack, right? So you have at the top layer a storage application. It talks down through typically a POSIX file system, volume manager, driver, and so forth. And then that's connected to a storage server that's sitting in a rack somewhere with probably some expensive parts in there and connected to a, a number of devices behind it over SAS. If you think about the fact that now we're talking about object storage applications, maybe or maybe not this kind of a stack is efficient, right? So at the top layer there, you have object storage applications. And those objects are dealing with keys and values. And they, objects are meant to be, to be written and to be read, to be replaced, to be deleted, but never to be modified. So do we need some of the POSIX file system type semantics? Do we need big, deep directory trees? Do we need that kind of overhead? Um, that's a reasonable question, right? At the end of the day, currently, this stack just takes those object storage applications that want to deal with keys and values up at the top level, and it goes through a bunch of machinations and manipulations to, at the end of the day, spit out blocks and sectors. And then when it wants to read that data, it goes through the reverse process and goes up. There's a bunch of metadata overhead. There are a bunch of inefficient pieces in there, right? So um, perhaps the time is right to take out a clean sheet of paper and say again, if we're looking at this open, software-defined, uh, much more flexible or, or ecosystem, and we're looking at object storage, maybe the picture could be different. What if those types of applications that are dealing with objects, the big object storage applications that are everybody in cloud is doing today, could talk straight over Ethernet directly to devices that became key value stores? And we could truly eliminate those layers of both software and hardware that serve a great purpose. Those are great technologies for different use cases. They're just not the right, it's not the right architecture for the use case that is massive scale out data centers uh, doing object storage, where the design objectives are things like capacity, power, TCO. Um, they are not things like absolute low latency kinds of performance. So what it takes to get there, if you start from the device perspective, is what Seagate has introduced. A kinetic device is a standard recording device. It adds two very important things, neither of which by itself is sufficient. The first is a key value API, and the second is Ethernet. 
This is not OSD. This is not iSCSI. Neither of those things truly lets us eliminate those tiers of file systems, other software, and the storage, the physical storage servers in the racks. We need both in order to break free and, and eliminate all those costs and that, that rigidity that exists. So that's, a, that's the kinetic device. But it's really more than a device. It's really a platform, right? So what we have launched with Kinetic is the Kinetic Open Storage Platform. It starts with the device. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But it's bigger than that. It also includes an API, which will be open source, and a series of libraries to, to, to let that API be easily integrated into any and every cloud storage stack. Right, so SwiftStack has implemented this API in Swift. Basho has implemented in React CS. Uh, it's also working in HDFS. We have customers working with us there. Um, and we're working with InkTank on Ceph. Uh, can be any cloud stack. The idea is open source API that facilitates these object storage applications to be able to talk much more efficiently in their language, that language being keys and values, directly to the device and to do so over Ethernet. So Seagate's piece of this is obviously in that lower part of this picture here. You'll see a number of devices down there. Um, the contribution we made, we made two contributions to open compute that were announced today. The first is the interface spec. Um, and again, I'm going to talk more about what that spec is and what the drive is. But really important. Seagate will provide hard drives behind this, a wide variety of drives and device types, potentially. But we expect other people to do so as well. And we're very excited about contributing the interface spec to open compute to facilitate that kind of innovation. We fully recognize and appreciate that big customers want to have second sources, and, and we're eager to have that happen. That's one of the key reasons we are moving forward with getting this interface spec and the developer tools into open compute and why the API and libraries are going to be fully open sourced. Um, an example of people picking up that spec and working with it. I mentioned both Hive and WeWin have systems here on hand uh, in the expo hall in their booths. So please go check them out. Um, somebody else mentioned, I think Aaron from Rackspace mentioned uh, earlier, pace of innovation. And that's clearly a big theme with open compute. Um, I just want to note that both of those systems uh, that, are, that are on hand today are um, early systems that have come up in you know, about a month's time. Right? We, we are working very hard to make this whole platform be very easily integrated and adapted and so forth, and the reason we're actively engaging in an open way with it. So what does this architecture mean? Um, I'm going to get into the specifics of the cost savings and performance implications. But at the very top level, these devices are now all connected over TCP IP directly to whatever, wherever the storage application server is running, the storage server system is running. You can truly now separate storage from compute. You can roll in racks and racks and racks of the most dense storage possible at the lowest, cost econo lowest possible economics. And you can roll them in across the hall, across the data center, doesn't matter where. right? You are no longer tethered via SAS cables um, and in a situation where likely you're over-provisioning over compute unnecessarily. So a uh, little bit of show and tell here. I am holding in my hand a kinetic device. Um, that connector that you see, the interface spec, is what was contributed today, along with a, a T card for developers to, to start working. Um, it's probably difficult to see here. This in my right hand is a traditional board for the exact same 4 terabyte drive. Oh, there it is. <laughs> you can see the connector, the connector is exactly the same. This is super important for us from a manufacturability perspective. It's also super important for those systems builders to be able to m adapt and work very quickly and get these things into systems with very uh, minimal changes. So let's talk about um, the systems. I mentioned each drive has two Ethernet ports. That connector has just been repinned from SAS to Ethernet. Um, this is an example of a system. What you see here is. These drives now plug directly into the backplane. Instead of having a SAS switch on the backplane, it has an Ethernet switch. And that switch pumps Ethernet right to the top of the rack. So we're not talking about a whole bunch of new ports, not a whole bunch of new cables, really a simple change, swapping out a SAS expander for an Ethernet backplane. 
So the next question I get as we get out talking about this is, oh, all this Ethernet, what does that do to my network? What does that do to my network? Well, the truth is, if you look at the traditional architecture network, very simplified on the left, on my left, you've got some client somewhere generating a bunch of data, and that goes over the data center fabric, as it is today, already going over Ethernet, and it ends up in the data center going through another top of rack switch and down into data nodes or storage servers in that rack. In this case, you've got three of them connected to a bunch of JBODs. That data is already going over the network. In the kinetic architecture on the right, the same thing happens. One of the design imperatives of kinetic is that it imposes absolutely no new requirements on the data center. It's really important. We want this to be plug and play, take advantage of that existing fabric that is within data centers and easily taken advantage of, relatively free once inside. OK, so I'm going to step back a little bit now um, and talk about why, why we're doing this. The first is really about, uh, again, about pace of innovation and flexibility. Um, it's been hit on lots of times today in other, other forums, but putting the device at the key value layer, letting it manage the space and talk in keys and values has some really interesting implications for device level innovation. I'm imagining that some people in this room have struggled with uh, the transition to 4K sectors. This is a device level innovation that has been re was required to, for all of us to continue to advance and provide the capacity we needed, but it's been painful for the industry to adapt to adopt because it requires big host software changes. I'm, most of you have probably heard of SMR, Shingled Magnetic Recording. This one's coming too. It's necessary, it's inevitable, it's critical for aerial density gains, but it's going to have a big impact on host system software in certain workloads. People are going to have to change their, their applications in order to not have a performance implication as we go to this shingled magnetic recording format. Um, when you have a key value device that does the space management, all of those kinds of innovations and future innovations come for free, whether that's more robust drive health and manageability solutions, whether it's advanced security features, all of that stuff comes for free, and the host no longer has to worry about telling the device where to put data. The device does what it does best, right? Storage system applications still do all the things they do best. They do the clustering, they do the management, they do the reliability, they do replication, they do erasure coding. All of that still resides in Swift or whatever the other thing, the other whatever your object's storage stack is, the device isn't doing that. It's just doing the part that it does best, which is the space management. On the performance side, that same architecture has some other big impacts. Two reasons that performance is really interesting in the kinetic world. Um, the first is that the data is streaming to the disk as it's written. So. All of those other layers go out of the way. Remember that you, you're, you're no longer, you don't have a, a file system and so forth. The data can just stream as it's written. The device has become a log structured device. We put the information where it needs to be to be most effectively read back later sequentially in the background. So you don't pay a penalty up front for doing that. In some workloads, and we're seeing early performance results to, to show this, we expect that random write performance be, could be as much as four times better because of that. The other piece is um, I.O. efficiency. So we hear this a lot, right? We have these drives getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and, and I.O. is not scaling as quickly or effectively as capacity does. It never has. Um, well, one thing that's going on with these file systems is that they're thrashing the disk around doing, doing what we call the silly stuff, right? We did a benchmark we spoke about um, at the OpenStack Summit last April, actually, which was a, running a Swift cluster. And in that case, 92% of the operations moved only 0.5% of the data. The, the file system was doing pre-space management. It was checking out inodes. It was doing all the other things that a file system would do, which is very inefficient for the drive. And this architecture, because the drive is doing the space management, there literally is no metadata overhead coming from a file system. We can make that much more efficient. So two really important pieces there. 
most important, back to the cost, that $240 billion number. Kinetic has a huge opportunity to drive breakthrough economics. Um, and this is why we're seeing such excitement in the market about this technology. First and foremost, the benefits come from pulling all of those storage, storage servers out of the rack. So remember, you've got object storage applications which now talk directly to key value devices, and you pull out the need to go through a storage system in the rack. Um, the impact of that um, is threefold. We've modeled threefold, very simple so far. It does not yet encompass things like the performance gains or things like future kinds of benefits that could come from um, racks of these systems, different power opportunities and so forth that, that we have in our sites. But at the very first level, three things. Um, first, you pull out a lot of capital costs from those storage servers, right? So if a company is running, uh, you know, 15 drives per server, um, in this case, the, store, the savings could be up to 50% total cost of ownership gains, right? That particular makeup is in use at, at many of the Tier 1 CSPs around the globe. Um, the other two factors, that CapEx cost contributes about 70% of the total gain. There are two other factors that are really important. This drive, the kinetic drive, has about three watts more power than this drive, the same exact four terabyte uh, traditional drive. But at the rack level, the, uh, the power consumption comes way down because again, you're pulling out numerous storage servers from that rack that have a much, much heavier power overhead. And the third thing that comes into play on the OPEX side right off the bat is you've eliminated that storage server, which is the, the higher order failure domain, right? So if a storage server fails in Iraq and you've got 12 or 36 or 60 drives behind it, it's probably a pretty mandatory maintenance event, right? You need, somebody needs to go replace that server or bring it back up. In the kinetic case, one drive fails, it's a solo actor, not a big deal. And, and, and you can always bring up another server somewhere else and talk to it. If a server in the cloud go, at the client side goes down, just bring up another one. It can talk to that same device. So many fewer technicians can manage many more racks of, of storage, or the same number of technicians can manage even that many more. So those three factors um, are driving massive gains already. We're seeing, as I said, up to potential for up to as much as 50% gains. So um, I've got seven seconds left, so I guess we're right on time. <laughs> Quick summary. Why are we doing this? That is a gigantic amount of data that needs to be stored. It's going to cost all of us a lot. And Seagate believes that the time is right now to take out a clean sheet of paper, look at a much more open, flexible landscape and environment and set of partners to work with, and say, if we were all to design the storage stack today for these scale-out object storage use cases, what would it look like? We think it looks like Kinetic because it delivers significantly improved total cost of ownership. It truly lets us all separate and disaggregate the storage from compute and be able to scale out much more effectively and efficiently. It improves performance. In most cases, this 5900 RPM drive, a Kinetic one, is going to outperform a 7200 RPM drive. Again, more cost advantage, cost advantage. And then this whole bit about software and DevOps flexibility and pace of innovation, right? We want to abstract the tough part of drive internal innovation, give a new interface that lets the host system software move independently and not have a, such a hard time uh, ingesting and consuming necessary drive level innovation. This, this, this puts the, play, the line in the right place and lets the device manufacturers do what we need to do at the fastest possible pace and similarly on the host system side. Um, we think it's a pretty compelling story. We are seeing great traction, again, with the partners that have systems here, a lot of the big cloud providers, the software stacks implementing this. We're excited to talk to anybody and everybody who's uh, interested in about it. Please check out the, the, the systems that are available with both Hive and WeWin today. And tomorrow, there's also a storage track presentation at, at uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon where you can get much more technical about exactly the details. Um, and also, finally, if you look at developers.seagate.com, you can get your hands on a simulator today, start playing with it, start see how the, seeing how the API is working, and really begin to get, uh, get deeper in this as we go forward. Thank you very much.